When you're an applicable large employer and you're considering your benefits, it's, it spans a wide range of, of areas for consideration, one of which is pure plan design. You know, so what are you offering to your employees? But then you actually have to even step back and look more philosophically at why you're offering coverage, uh, what types of coverage you're offering, how does that mesh up with the rules, and then when you take it one step forward, where are all of your costs, which is the biggest piece of uh, what happens in the ACA in this new world, because some of the things that it requires aren't sitting there on the surface. It requires uh, a look at what some of the, the short-term tax implications are, uh, but administratively, how hard is it to administer your plans, uh, deliver communications to employees? Those are some of the more hidden costs that aren't readily available that empl all employers need to be considering as they look at the ACA from a strategic perspective. There are different types of tools that are available uh, to employers first to understand whether or not it applies to them. Uh, calculators and such that are available to look at your employee population and do the math on, on hours. Now you don't really want to be relying on uh, something that informal on a long-term basis. One of the things the ACA does is uh, starting in 2016 is introduces new reporting requirements for applicable large employers. So those reporting requirements will require employers to have a good grip on eligibility, hours, and be able to report the, this information to the, to the federal government. Uh, so really you do have to have a system in check uh, that allows you to complete that portion of the process. Traditionally that would come through your, your HRIS payroll system. So a lot of uh, payroll system providers are coming forward introducing modules, plugins, additional applications that uh, a company would either buy into or use, uh, add on to their existing platform so that they can make these counting exercises very easy. They have custom reporting packages that are built specifically to handle these, these new IRS reporting obligations. And so for right now, it's very important for an employer to start asking those questions of their, their payroll manager, whoever's handling or res responsible for those systems. What is our, our ACA platform? How are we going to be able to both count these hours and then secondarily, how are we going to be able to report these hours once that time comes? Yeah, 6055 and 6056 are the sections of the IRS code that now apply to new reporting obligations for employers. So this is the place and time where uh, an employer will, if you, have, if you offer minimum essential coverage, which is the coverage that most employers would be offering, uh, that's part of the 6055 section reporting obligation. With, so there's a reporting component, but then there's also a notification component that goes along with it, uh, which is still yet to be flushed out in full in terms of what that notification will look like, but in theory, employers will be notifying their employees based on this reporting requirement. Uh, 6056 is, is attached to, you're, you're now known as the applicable large employer, and in that space, what we're doing is actually providing information to the government to try to mechanize the whole subject of who's eligible, who's not, who's working to the 30-hour rule, how many employees are in that bucket, uh, in an effort to try to make this process work a little bit more efficiently. Uh, so that is where the employer would be actually uploading, if you want to call it census, information about their employees, their hours worked, things they're not doing today uh, in terms of a required governmental reporting, all of that would be wrapped up in this 6056 reporting obligation. The government wants to use the employer, any employer, as a mouthpiece, you know, an, an assistant in getting the word out to those who work for them about the health insurance marketplace. So they came up with a, mo a notice that includes a, a model. Uh, employers can use the model as they see fit. Uh, that model notice had a one-time issuance that came about last fall that was to go out and had a deadline. It was to go out to all employees. Uh, 
but carrying forward, uh, it's important for employers to be putting that notice into the hands of new employees as they come into the organization. Again, under the guise of allowing a new employee to understand that this marketplace exists and they may have coverage op options there. It, it's not as easy as it seems on the surface. Once you start to look at, there are sections of that model that uh, ask the employer to provide information about the types of insurance they, they offer. Uh, so from that standpoint, there's some debate that goes on relative to how an employer would answer a specific question. Uh, certainly how far in advance. Some of it has to do with looking into the next plan year as you're coming to the end of a current plan year and the content that you would put on that statement uh, would change. Uh, so in terms of what you're charging employers, there, there are types of anticipation questions. And so it gets a little complicated uh, when you start thinking about that from that perspective, but employers at a basic level need to know that this thing exists, whether they're offering coverage or not, and supply it to employees as they're coming into their organization. Yeah, I mean, for, in terms of broad strategies, they, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, play is one, right? So an employer is already offering insurance and plans to continue to do that. By and large, that's what we see most employers doing right now. Uh, for them, it becomes that big consideration around, okay, if I'm offering coverage, is it compliant? I call it ACA friendly. So does it match the minimum value rules? Does it, are we offering coverage to dependents? Uh, do we have our affordability locked down? And what is that all costing, uh, uh, costing the organization? So, uh, so at the end of that consideration, it is we're going to stay in the game. We might be offering different products, uh, but by and large, we plan on continuing to maintain an offering for our employees. Uh, there's the uh, the whole notion of this other type of playing environment, which is through a private exchange. Uh, we're seeing more and more talk about uh, defined contribution health care, which is the, the concept of fixing costs for an employer, whereby the employer would say, here's how much I'm willing to, to put into my insurance. I'm going to contract with uh, some third party that enables me to participate in a private insurance exchange, which is not the, the government's version of it, so it's more controlled, more refined. Uh, we'll offer that to our employees, and therefore I know what my costs are, and I know what my tolerance is, and I will adjust that every year. Um, so it is a dramatically shifted way of, and it's very appealing to employers, this notion of fixed cost uh, plan delivery. The, the question, though, will become over time, are you truly fixing the costs and what does it take to get from here to there? So uh, it is very intriguing, uh, but it is very early on and so the jury's still out in terms of how we start to move that one forward, but it is an, an option that's available in many cases. Then we have the other scenarios that come along with uh, pay scenarios. So these are the ones that employers who are not offering coverage maybe will continue to, to not offer coverage and they may actually have a new story to tell employees about the health insurance marketplace. So they're, they're playing off of that uh, availability in a new way, which is interesting, but uh, for those who are offering coverage, it's that possibility of dropping coverage and sending employees to the exchange, which may be viable and it may be a positive story in some cases for that employer that's really struggled for many, many years with maintaining the offering they're having. It's expensive. Uh, many times they have their employees telling them, we don't like this coverage. You, know, you come to me, I'm the owner every year, you tell me you don't like it, you don't like that I'm charging you more, so I'm going to send you to the exchange and based on how much you earn, because we've taken a look at that, uh, we know you, the majority of our employees potentially will qualify for a subsidy. We're going to show you how to do that, how to go about it, so there might be some advocacy that they're now playing on behalf of their employees as opposed to actually offering the, the coverage, but at the end of the day, um, sending them out to the marketplace. Uh, some employers are saying, I guess, and that would be the, the other strategy, is I'm going to send them out and I'm going to subsidize them in some way. Now, this, the, the ability to subsidize is, is limited in the traditional sense of what an employer would want to hear, and what an employer wants to hear is, can I take a tax incentive for subsidizing my employees? And uh, the rules are pretty clear that, that that's not an option. So now you're looking at gross-ups and it becomes a matter of considering if I'm giving employees money, how much money is the money, knowing that uh, it would be taxed. Uh, so, but the, the idea is 
similar type of situation as we discussed earlier, uh, putting people in a, in a position to be able to go out to the exchange and look at their options, get subsidized in the individual market, um, and, and then take it from there.